Happy Sabbath Church. Happy Sabbath Church. How are you doing today? You're doing good. Praise the Lord. I bring you greetings from the Co-op City Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, Pastor Steve Kasimi and his wife, they send their greetings to you. Today, I'm here with my wife, Rose. She's sitting there. We are glad to be here, and I want to thank your pastor, Pastor Wayne Jamel, for giving me the call, the opportunity to stand before you today to share the Word of God. I knew Pastor Wayne from the time the father was the church pastor at Co-op City, and I have watched him grow up to be the young and the prospective rising star that he is. Praise the Lord. And we want to thank you for the support that you give him. That makes his ministry powerful. Our scripture reading today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 7, verses 9 through 16, which says, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him. Seventy-five people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died. He and our fathers. And they were carried back to Sechem and laid in the tomb of Abraham. The tomb Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamo, the father of Sechem. Amen? Because God moves in a mysterious ways, he moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. That's something we, we sing the song, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. So i like to share with you, just in case somebody decides to leave before the sermon is over, i like to begin sharing with you three principles that when you just walk out, you will have gained something that will last a lifetime for you and will strengthen your faith forever. And that is called Emuna. But that's not the title of my sermon today. We get to that. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the beautiful Sabbath day we have today. We pray that the word that we come out today because when it comes to your word, is the word, not words. Father, whatever word that you give to your church today, that it will be a blessing to them. That it will touch souls and bring conversion into righteousness in Jesus' name. What is immune? That sounds strange, but it's just a Hebrew word that is generally translated as faith. However, immune is somewhat, in its explanation, deeper than faith. It is an innate conviction, a perception of truth that transcends reason. It also evades reason and wisdom. In other words, immune can only become a framework through which we understand who God really is. Looking at the church today, I'm sure you may have had hyper preachers 
who preach, and then the roof will go off. But I'm looking at the church now. I'm looking at you. I really can't make out what really this church is. Are you the kind that will be quiet and listen to our lecture? Are you the Bible study church? Or are you the Pentecostal type? I don't know yet. This is my first time here. Whatever the case may be, but I know that God has given me a message. A message that had been with me throughout the week. I've wrestled with it. I, you know, when you have an appointment to preach, sometimes you may end up writing two, three sermons. You get confused. You don't know why, especially when you don't know the audience you're going to preach. But I believe that the message I have for you today is what God has answered my prayer for you. So a minute will be our framework for you to understand the message I'm going to give. So that will be the framework. Let me walk you through this framework. It has three principles. The first one is that God is the creator. I want everyone here before you leave understand that God is the creator. If you do not believe that God is the creator, every, everything else is bothered us. Nothing has no meaning. Now, if God is the creator, then he has a sovereign power over you and me. Is that right? Do we all believe that? Okay, we believe that principle number one. That's the first principle of the framework. Now, the second principle is that whatever God does is for our best, right? He allows everything that happens to us for the best possible outcome. That would be like a hard pill to swallow. But just understand, like John, 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayst prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So whatever God allows is for the best. God is the creator, your owner. He owns me. He owns you. He owns the universe. And then whatever he does is for the best. Because it's his word. You are his daughter. You are his son. You are his handiwork. So everything that he will allow to transpire in your life is for the best, even though you may not understand it. Now, the last principle of the framework is that whatever God does is for a purpose. It's for a purpose. And we try to understand our experiences based on these three principles. Prophet Jeremiah noted in Jeremiah 32, 19, saying, Great are your purposes, and mighty are your deeds. So God is a God of purpose, a creator who looks for the best for his children, and a purposeful God. Amen? All right. I don't know if you say amen, if you are the amen church, Whatever the case is, but I know preachers get energized when they hear amen. It's a way of communicating back to the preacher that you are still with him. You are not sleeping. So once you understand and keep these principles in your mind as you listen to me today, you'll be able to make sense of everything the Bible says. You will make sense of my sermon and your faith will increase. That's why I spent some time explaining it before I start my message titled, when the Lord is with you. And I like the, apostle, uh, the, the apostles in Luke, just like the apostles in Luke 17, 5 say, you will shout, Lord, increase our faith. So at the end of this message, I want you to leave here asking God to increase your faith, increase your immune, to understand that you live under his banner. When God is with you, history, secular and religious, is a pageant of God moving in people's lives. 
is a demonstration of how God has been with his people, how people flourish, how people are favored when God is with them. Some people are highly favored, either because of strong faith in God or because God wants them to accomplish a special purpose for his glory. Moses was favored because God has a special purpose for him. Even from the time he was in the crib, because God knows the future, he preserved Moses' life. He could have been killed alongside with other infants, but Moses' life was spared. Because God had proposed that he will be the one to set his people free. Now you think about Esther. Whatever happened between Esther and her relative being in that place at that time, like she said, who knows whether God put me in this place for a time like this. It was for a purpose. We look at the three Hebrew boys when they were put in the fiery furnace. God went there with them because God purposely wanted the king and all the people know that there is a God in heaven who controls the affairs of men. We can go on and on and read about Daniel and all the rest of them. You will discover that when God is with you, he's going to favor you. He's going to make a way for his purpose to come true through your experiences. In all of these, we see that whatever God does, he does it for our best and for our purpose. Now, let me zoom in on the Bible story, one of the uh, stories that showcase what it means for God to be with a person. The story of Joseph that was just abbreviated in the New Testament verse that, uh, chapter that we read. So the story we read in Acts 7, 9 through 16 is just a summary of chapters 37, 38, 37 and 39. Because 38, there's a skip there, starts talking about another story in between, but that's not like a direct continuation. So in Genesis 37, says the background of a young man that God was with, and that's Joseph. Now, how did this happen? Because it tells us that Joseph found himself in Egypt, but he had an origin. Because Joseph was one of the sons of Jacob, the youngest one, and he had dreams. He was a dreamer. God revealed the things that will happen because you are going to find the text we tell you later on that God was with him. So God revealed to him what was going to happen through his dreams. Joseph was made to understand that he was going to have rulership over his parents and his brothers. And he had these dreams. And when he told these dreams, he told it the first time. They took it with a grain of salt. They asked, does that mean that we are going to bow down to you? Does that mean we are going to serve you? They started to become angry with him and became jealous with him. But God was with him. Now Joseph had another dream and he told that even his father was uncomfortable with the story that, with the dream that he asked him, does that mean that myself, your mom, and your brothers will bow down to the earth for you? What are you talking about? But the father, you know, being a man of God, took it in and was watching what was going to happen. The Bible tells me in this story that his brothers hated him even more. They become envious of him. Now, it happened that one day when they went to seek him to shepherd their flock, that the father called him and said, uh, your brothers are in the field. And uh, before then, Joseph had been known to bring bad stories about his brothers. His brothers were really bad. And in today's language, he said he was snitching on them. So he was snitching on them. So... His brothers did not like him, especially they were not from the same mom. But he was snitching on them. The Bible tells me in 37 here that he was bringing evil news to his father. So these gentlemen were devious young men. Do you understand? They were devious. And Joseph, in addition to snitching on them, which was sufficient enough to caused them to hate him, was now trying to tell them that he was going to have dominance over them. That was no good news at all for them. They wouldn't like it. You wouldn't like it either. 
Now, to add insult to injury, or what do you say? Is this insult, right? Okay. Now, the father made a tunic of many colors. Many colors because he loved him. It's like he was rubbing it on their face. So, now that angered him, that, that made them, the Bible tells me there that they understood that his father loved him above all of his children and daughters because he had daughters as well. Though they were not mentioned, the focus was on the brothers. He had daughters. So all of them, everybody understood that Joseph was the beloved of the father. And his father always liked to keep him closer because he was the child of his old age, right? Now, when this day came, he said, okay, now you're going to take some food to your brothers who are in the field. And then go see how they fare and then bring me some news. Joseph went. And the story goes on that as soon as they saw him from afar, they saw the tunic and they planned to kill him right away. They planned to kill him. They didn't wait to hear anything from him. The sight of that tunic was just enough to cause them to plan to kill him. And they conspired as well. So while he brought the food, they took the food from him and they planned Oh, what are we going to do with him? What are we going to do with him? Then the older brother Benjamin said, you know what? Uh, let's not just kill him. Let's put him in a pit. His intention was that later on he will go and retrieve him there and send him safely to his father, back to his father. But now, within this period, it looked like Benjamin, because the story says that when uh, Benjamin came back, they had already planned because they saw they saw the Ishmaelites coming. And Judah said to them, oh, why would we kill our brother and his blood will be on our head? Why don't we just sell him to these Ishmaelites who were carrying myrrh and other spices to Egypt? So they decided, okay, that sounds like a good deal. At least his blood will not be on our hands. So they conspired and sold him for 20 uh, pieces of silver. Meanwhile, Benjamin was not around. So when Benjamin came back, they had already sold him. So, Ru uh, Reuben, sorry, Reuben, Reuben, Reuben. Thank you, Reuben. Thank you. So when Reuben came back, then they had sold him. He looked, he was no longer there. So what they decided now, they came up with a quick plan, a quick fix to their sin. They said, okay, we will have to kill a lamb now, pour the blood on this tunic, and send it to the father, and then say, do you know who this belongs to? And they did that. So, now the people who had bought the Ishmaelites, now the, that's where the story continues in verse 39. Now, the Ishmaelites bought Joseph, and they sold him to Potiphar in Egypt. Now Joseph became a slave. The father was grieving because when the father saw the tunic, he said, yes, this belongs to my son. He must have been killed. And even the brothers joined with their sisters. That's when their names were mentioned. And they all mourned with the father. From the story so far, it appears that the Lord was not with Joseph. Right? Because if the Lord was with Joseph, right, he would have not allowed him to be sold into slavery. It appears... Uh, and makes the reader doubt what is written in the book of Second Chronicles 16.9 when it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. So it makes you doubt that God is actually looking after his children. It makes one wonder, how is it that God the creator, he is the creator and he could not protect an innocent teenage boy. It makes one wonder how in everything that God does, he does for our best. How come that this was not for Joseph's best? He, nobody knew at the time. It was not the best for Jacob, his father, either, because he's not going to grieve unto death. The answer to these questions is very simple. Just one answer. 
God declared in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Also, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So when God is with you, all you need to do is to remain calm and let God work things out in your life. Now, Joseph becomes a slave in Egypt, and the story takes on a new twist. Genesis 39, as we go through, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the God, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. When God is with you, he will bring success your way. How do I know from this story? It tells us that the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord saved, gave him success in everything he did. Now that moves to the next step. When the Lord is with you, he is going to grant you favors. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master when his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted him to his care, everything he owed, everything he owned. When God is with you, he's going to grant you favors. You do not need to be agitated. You, didn't, you do not need to worry too much. All you have to do is to recognize that God is your creator. If he's your creator, whatever he's doing in your life is for the best and is for a purpose. He is going to favor you. He makes your presence a blessing to others when he's with you. When God is with you, your presence alone becomes a blessing to other people. How did this work for Joseph? From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owed, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessings of the Lord was everything Potiphar had both in house and in the field. Just because of one person that God was with, now, the house was, it was just not everything that he had within the immediate household. But even in the field, in other words, his cattle, his sheep, whatever he had, his animals multiplied because of one person that God was with. When God is with you, the Yonkers SDA church will prosper. When God is with you, the spiritual level of the church will go up. When God is with you, just like the house of Potiphar was not just the limit to what God can do. The community, just like the field, will benefit from the presence of this church. When God is with the members of the Yonkers Church. Not only that, when God is with you, he's going to elev elevate you. God elevates you. God puts you on a higher pedestal. Verse 6 says that, so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. So God elevated Joseph, a slave boy. He is now in high position, trusted with everything that he owned, except one thing that you will find out later. So when God is with you, He's going to elevate you on your job. People may stand in your way, but if God is with you, one day he is going to put you on a higher pedestal. When God is with you, in your family, he may pick you up to be the burden bearer of the family. He may elevate you just to help the family. And I'm sure somebody here may be in that position, whereby you are the burden bearer of the family. Sometimes we feel the pain that 
everything falls on us, but who knows whether just like Esther, God put you on that pedestal for that purpose. And when God is with you, it's just not going to be a cakewalk. Everything is not going to be rosy. He is going to allow temptations to test your integrity and to prove your abide to prove his abiding presence with you. God is going to allow some temptations to come your way. Now, in verses 7 through 20, we read that Joseph was well built and handsome. His problem is going to come now. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he entrusted to my care. No one is greater in the house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. Now then, how then could I do such a wicked thing against God? Do you see why God was with Joseph? Joseph feared God. He feared God. He would not sacrifice his reverence, his fear for God, for personal loss and passion. Now, Joseph knew that all that was going on for him was because the Lord was with him, and any sin against his master was sin against God. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. So sometimes we need to act like Joseph. Joseph refused and also refused to even be with her. You can't sit close to your temptation. You can't have an affinity with your source of temptation. Sometimes people get into a mess because they stayed too long. There is time to exit. If you are wise, you will figure out this is not going the right direction. It is time for me to cut off this relationship because it's not going to end well. But many people are full of presumptions. I can handle it. I'm strong enough. And before you know it, they're into it. Before you know it, the devil has brought a mess on them. Before you know it, it now becomes the church, not the individual who did it. That's the implication. That's the implication of sticking too long with temptation. Sticking too long with friends that will not bring you a spiritual upliftment. Sticking too long with situations. Staying too long in places you are not supposed to go. One day, he went into the house to attend to his duties. Listen now. The previous verse told us that he even avoided staying with her. But he has to do his duty. So one day, he went into the house to attend to his duties. And none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak. She must have sneaked into the room and then caught him by his cloak. And then said, look at what she said. She said to him, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Ran out of the house. Sense of God, sometimes you need to run. In fact, not sometimes. All the time you need to run away from sin. You need to run away from temptation. It's just not going to be a work. You need to sprint. Sprint. Because we are not wrestling against blood and flesh, but against powers and principalities, against spiritual and evil forces. So you got to sprint away. If we have young people in the church here, you got to sprint away from sin. You got to run away from those friends who want to lure you into things that are clear to you are unrighteous. 
adults should do the same thing. Then, when she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak be beside and ran out of the house. A perfect setup. A perfect setup. The evidence, she had the evidence. She had the evidence. She had Joseph's cloak in her hand. And there is no way denying that. That was a perfect, perfect plot. But you know what? When God is with you, even when all the dogs are lined up straight against you, when all the stars are in perfect alignment against you, God will make a way out because he is with you. That is why I have learned uh, back home in the country where I was raised, born and raised in Nigeria, in my own culture, we were taught that the easiest way when you have a problem is just to say the truth. Maybe they will be lenient to you than lying, right? But unfortunately, when I came to this country, I learned that from the things you watch and the experience, I learned that somebody can just get up and say something against you that had never entered your mind. Isn't that true? I have watched it in the news. People, after spending 10, 20 years in prison, they came out to confess. After somebody had been in prison for 10 years, somebody says, oh, he was not the person that raped me. I just made it up. This was a perfect plot. She had all pieces of evidence. Joseph was in that room. She has Joseph's cloak in her hand. What else do you need? But not only that, in order to instigate further the head, she said, this Hebrew boy. In other words, Hebrew boy, he was not supposed to be there. So he has come, so if you don't do anything, he has come to make sport of force. He has come to make us a spectacle of shame. Sometimes you may have your problems. You may have all those things, negatives, lined up against you that you have no idea. The rumors might be going behind you. You have no idea. You're walking into a place, everybody's looking at you funny. Because you, you have been sold for something you have no idea. She kept, his, she kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew boy slave you brought. Look at, she's adding more adjectives and upon layers of adjectives. The, that Hebrew slave you brought. Hebrew slave. Now, not just a Hebrew, he's also a slave because now he's bringing it to the master that the level escalating, the level of insult. He's your slave. He's a Hebrew boy. He says, okay, he says, she kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story, that Hebrew slave you brought us, came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his clothes beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. There is no record of anybody asking whether it was true or not. He was put in prison right away. Are there situations where you had been punished without fear hearing? We may, not, we may have been doing that when we condemn people. We have the tendency to condemn people based on just, I heard it, so it is. We condemn. All right? 
we condemn people, we write them off just based on, we all have that tendency, every one of us. And if you think you don't, you are lying to yourself. That's a human nature that we just run quickly to judge. We run quickly into conclusions. That is why we have to be careful. We have to pray to God to grant us the patience to give a second chance. Now, when God is with you, he shows you kindness and favor in times of trouble. Now, Joseph is in serious trouble. He is in jail right now. But remember, God is with him. So the story goes on to say, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Psalm 35, Psalm chapter 30, verse 5 says, For his anger lasts only, lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may endure for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Joseph is in prison, but if the Lord is with you, he is with you for a long run. He's not going to let you down. He's not going to lead you halfway. He's going to lead you all the way. Even in prison, he's going to be there with you in prison. God knew he was there. God knows your darkest moments. He knows when you are in trouble. So he will never leave you alone. He's going to be with you. All you have to do is to remain faithful. And when God is with you, he rewrites your story, restores you to your former glory, and makes you a success once more. You may have some downfalls, but God will restore you. Now, just some Chapter 84, verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a son and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good things does he withhold from those who walk in blamelessness. So the word put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. Joseph was elevated, somebody who was a Hebrew boy, a slave and a prisoner. Because the Lord was with Joseph, he gave him success in whatever he did. That's what the scripture says. If the Lord is with you, he's going to give you success in whatever you are doing. It may take time. You may experience some down times. You may experience some disappointments. Are you a student? You may experience some bad grades. You may experience a professor who doesn't like you. You may experience all kinds of all obstacles in your relationships. But if the Lord is with you, he will see you through it. Now, the story continues. It continues because Joseph, at this moment, has become elevated. He was in church. And down the line, we discover that Joseph even ended up, ended up in the face of Pharaoh. He ended up becoming like a governor of the land, which brought the story, the account that was given in us into conclusion where the parents had to be invited. But overall, what I brought to you today is, I'm going to end this story here. I'm not going to go all the way. It's just that when God is with you, everything in your life is going to be possible. So what does... Who does God favor? That would be the question. What is the condition? Joseph was a righteous person. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 1 to 4 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commandments in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never, never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and good name in the sight of God and man. And it goes on, Proverbs 3, 33 through 35 says, The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. Sam says, Psalm chapter 5 says, Surely the Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor. As with the shield, Joseph was, right, was a righteous man. He kept the commandments of God. How do I know? Because he knew that it was not good for him to commit adultery with the wife 
of Potiphar. He says, how can I do this evil thing against God and my master? He was a righteous young man. Then he was also humble. Humble. He was a humble person. In closing, are you confused about what to do in life? When God is with you, your song shall always be. He leadeth me, oh blessed thought, oh words with heavenly comfort from. Whatever I do, wherever I be, still God's hand that leads me. God's hand that leads me, you will submit to God. You will never, never get depressed because things are not working. Because it is not by might or by power. It is by the grace of God. So you submit yourself when you understand that God is the creator and whatever he does is for the best and he has a purpose for whatever you're going through. Are you depressed and feeling defeated? When God is with you, your song shall always be. Sometimes mere sins and deepest gloom. Sometimes where it is flower bloom. By waters come. All trouble see, still God's hand that leadeth me. You will understand that you're not on your own. You will understand that it's God who leads you. Are you lonely and you have no one to help? When God is with you, your song will be, Lord, I will clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content, whatever Lord I see, since it is God that leadeth me. Oftentimes, we are not content. We are not satisfied. We trouble so much and get depressed. We get High blood pressure because we are so much troubled about things of life. When we find ourselves in that situation and recognize that God is with us, all we have to do is to stretch out our hand and clasp our hand in God's hand. And we will never murmur or repine. We'll be content because it is God that leads us. Are you overwhelmed with life's problems and feeling like giving up on God? Yes, when God is with you, your song will always be, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Pilgrims through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven. Feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. You will understand that it is the Lord that will guide you. Because he is with you. Because he is the creator. Because whatever he does is for a purpose. And is for your best. You remember, you go back to these three principles. When you interpret everything that happens in your life within this framework, you will always see your faith grow. You will always see yourself calm in the midst of storm because you know that you are not in charge. Are you dealing with health issues that are driving you crazy and making you hopeless? When God is with you, your song will always be open now the crystal fountain. Raise the healing stream. The healing stream flow. Let the fire and the cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer. Be thou my strength and shield. Be thou my strength and shield. Are you sick? Are you sick? Do you have any illness that is bothering you? There is still Bam in Gilead. There is still Bam in Gilead. Just understand that God is your creator and he has something good for you. Even in your sickness, there's something he's working for your best. Even if you die out of it, it's for a purpose. We don't get depressed. We look at life differently. We respond to life differently when we understand that it's God that leads us. We will not be complaining like people who do not have God in their lives. We do not sorrow like unbelievers. We have a different attitude. Be 
people around you will feel some level of peace because you are not responding the way they do. That's going to, you, you, you remember, when God is with you, 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 you become a blessing to others. Not just material blessings, spiritual blessings, because they will look at you. They will wonder, how come you don't respond like all of us? Then that will open doors for you to share Jesus with them. Are you fearful of what the future holds for you? Many people are fearful today of what the future holds for them. You graduate from college, there is no job. You walk around, walk around, you don't know what you're going to do with your life. You are a grown lady, beautiful, you have everything in place, not so much of the fake, but you can't get a man. You are afraid. What's going on? What is it that I don't have going? Huh? What is it that I don't have going on for me? But you can find. You are fearful and afraid. But remember that if God is with you, he has somebody for you. All you have to do is to be faithful and look carefully. Look carefully. Don't be impatient. Don't run into a man to live with a man in order to be, be answer me, sis. After all, after a few months, he's going to dump you and you go back to miss. And some people don't want that. They still retain the name of the person, the last name of the person who hurt them so badly. And that becomes a daily stress for you. Just submit to God. Are you a young man and you can't make up your mind? You can't find sisters in the church. That doesn't mean you get hooked with unbelievers. Because the unbeliever is going to be worse than the believer. All right? You better get a lady from the church who doesn't have everything going, and you are at peace with that, that you're going there at the end of the day, you discover that most of them are fake. In all, if God is with you, in all, your refrain will be, he leadeth me. He leadeth me by his own hand. He leadeth me, his faithful follower I will be. For by his hand, he leads me. You are already blessed and highly favored because he loves you. We are all blessed. We are all favored because God is with us. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, he says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. We have been favored because God is with us. Let's claim the promise today and begin to sing that song. That he leads us because God is with us. God is with you. Shall we pray? Father and our God, we thank you because today you've opened our eyes once more to the truth. That when you are with us, we have nothing to fear. Lord, we want to pray that you strengthen our faith. Help us to always interpret our situations using the principles that you are the creator, the sovereign Lord of the universe. And that whatever you do in our lives is for the best. And that you have a purpose for us. And that purpose is that we remain in faith. And that when you come, you will see us as faithful servants who have waited for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.